Welcome to our online service today, January 21st, 2024. I'm Pastor Andy Munn. I am the pastor of Walnut Hill, and I'm glad that you've joined us today. I'm actually recording this service, just a brief service of prayer, and then ministry of the word on Saturday afternoon, January 20th. I'm so glad that you've joined us, and I pray that, that this time, particularly in the Word, would be beneficial to you and helpful. I want to let you know about a few things. Um, I want to remind you that this week the men will be gathering on Wednesday night at McAllister's Deli for a time of fellowship around a meal. We'll meet at 6.30 there. Also, the women's Bible study begins this week. It was postponed a week due to weather. Uh, there's information in the nutshell, which is our email announcements correspondence, so you can see the details there. Um, one announcement that I, I wanted to make for you, and it's a prayer request as well. Rick and Debbie Sacra, who were our missionaries for, to uh, ELWA for many years in Liberia, have had a change in missions organization and call that they, have, uh, that they are working with now. They're now working with an organization called Christian Revival Church Association of Liberia. And they're working with Pastor Dennis Agri and his wife, Vanya. Uh, the, the purpose and the goal of, of this particular organization is to raise up indigenous leaders for uh, Liberia and for, for, I'm sure, the surrounding areas in Africa. And so Rick and Debbie will be a part of that ministry now which is a change from their, their medical missions, but they will be doing medical mission trips and things like that as part of the ministries through Church Revival, uh, excuse me, Christian Revival Church Association. Uh, let me take a moment and let's just pray together in the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Father, we do come before you now as your people. And we ask that you would bless our brother and sister, Rick and Debbie Sacra, in this new mission that you've put them on. We ask that as they have needs arise, that you would provide for them and that the gospel would go forward in Liberia. We thank you for the, the years of ministry that you have seen fit to do through them in Liberia. And we ask for just a, a wonderful continued presence and connection with the people there. Father, I, I thank you for the people in our congregation, and there are a lot of different needs that we have here. There are many of us who have friends who are dealing with health issues and surgeries that have happened or are upcoming. We just pray that you would continue to do your work. We pray for those who have lost loved ones in the past few weeks and, and ask that you would be their comfort and their peace. Lord, I lift up to you, particularly Nell Cumbo, and ask that you would uh, grant her your peace by your spirit, and surely as well as she um, is looking after Nell, as Nell is in assisted living and in her last days. We thank you for the good report that Robert Dishner has, and that he's home and he's healing. Uh, we pray for continued healing for him. And Lord, now as we look into your word, we ask that you would work in us by your spirit. Even though we are apart at a distance, we pray that this time in the word would be a time in which you would minister by your spirit through your word. In Jesus name. Amen. Well, uh, I would encourage you to get your Bibles out and to turn to John chapter 18. Um, if you'll remember, we began John 18 just a, a few weeks ago, and in our studies, what, we, what I reminded you of is that 
Uh, in John 17, we have Jesus' longest recorded prayer. It's longest recorded, not necessarily his longest prayer. We don't know what that would have been. But, uh, but just before that, he had taught his disciples in the upper room a lot of things. He's letting them know he's going away. He's letting them know what, what the mark of his disciples are, to have love for one another. Um, he lets them know not to, not to be uh, troubled because he's going to return for them. So a lot of things going on in that upper room uh, discourse is what it's called, that conversation, the teaching that Jesus had. But when we move to John 18, Jesus and his disciples have left the upper room, and they go to a garden that they frequented in Gethsemane. And it's there that Judas betrays Jesus and brings the soldiers and the chief, uh, the temple officers to arrest him. Jesus then goes through a process with Caiaphas and Annas, Annas the, uh, uh, the leaders of, of the Jewish people at that time, really the, re the Jewish religious leaders. Um, and you can look back at other sermons to, to find out details about that. But what we do know is this that the, the church courts, if you will, the temple trial process that Jesus went through was questionable at least. And now Jesus is brought before Pilate, the Roman governor, who was in Jerusalem because of the Feast of Passover, not because he was a Jew, but because he, was, he would be stationed there to make sure there weren't any uprisings, so he and his armies could, could quelch any... Uh, uprisings that may happen. But what the Jewish leaders thought is that Pilate would give a rubber stamp on their decision that Jesus should be convicted of high treason and therefore be executed. But Pilate calls for a fresh trial. That surprised them. And here we are in our passage. John chapter 18, beginning at verse 33. Hear the word of the Lord. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Father, we ask that you would take this, your holy word, and make it sweeter than the drippings of the honeycomb. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I really enjoyed Christian music growing up in the late 70s and the 80s. And the first Petra album, Petra was a Christian rock band, the first Petra album I ever heard was entitled Not of This World. Now, I didn't know that Christian music could sound that good, and honestly, I was hooked to the music, but not just the music, but the message. Several years ago, one of my favorite bands called Galactic Cowboys, and yes, that is a, a real band, or at least was, they participated in a tribute album that many Christian bands uh, created doing covers of various songs by Petra. And the song that Galactic Cowboys chose was the song from that album, Not of This World. Now, I loved uh, the idea behind the song because, it's, and it's from Scripture, that we are aliens and strangers, we're not of this world. But, but I love the idea that we as Christians, who already feel like the odd man out in so much of what our culture desires, are told that we are aliens and strangers in this world. And this is because we are citizens of a different kingdom. Jesus tells Pilate in this narrative that his kingdom is not of this world. But what does Jesus mean, and what does that mean for us? I mean, when we think of a kingdom, honestly, we hear the word, we think of a king and queen. 
We think of someone who's in power. In fact, we even use that phrase, well, they just think they're over their own little kingdom, or we might even think of ourselves, this is our own little kingdom, and maybe we kind of like that. But as sinful humans, it's difficult not to think about the, the abuses that come with the power of somebody's kingdom. We hear about it all the time. We hear about all kinds of abuse of power. And, and isn't it interesting that, that so often, especially when we're thinking of political power, we tend to point the finger toward them. They are in power, so things are awful. If if we were in power, things would be better. And now that we have power, we're going to change things. This is very similar to the way Pilate understood kingdom. But Jesus tells us that his kingdom is a different kingdom. A not-of-this-world kingdom. And it is his kingdom that we need. There are three things that I'd like us to see from the text, these, these few verses today. What the kingdom is not, what the kingdom is, and why we need this kingdom. What the kingdom is not, what the kingdom is, and why we need this kingdom. So first, what the kingdom is not. After this, this questioning, or during this questioning, and we're going we're gonna to deal more with this passage next week, I actually had intended on preaching uh, uh, all of the passage this week, uh, but because of weather, I decided to just shorten things down. Hopefully this is shorter. haven't recorded it yet until now. But in the questioning, Pilate is very interested in what the Jews have been saying. They've said that, and this is part of their charge, that Jesus is saying he's king of the Jews. Therefore, to Pilate, they're hoping Pilate would catch this, he's trying to overthrow the Roman government. And so that's why they thought that he would give a very quick verdict, a very quick con conviction, and a sentence of death. Because Jesus would be, um, would be guilty of treason, and that's a capital offense. And so he would be executed. So in the interchange, that's why Pilate says, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, do you say this because you're saying it or because the high priests and, and, and the Jews have told you this? And Pilate answers, am I a Jew? Your, your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? <laughs> Pilate's looking at this going, I don't really know what you've done. And then Jesus gives this strange answer, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. And Jesus is saying that, that this kingdom that I'm the king of is not like the kingdoms of the world. Why not? Well, it's because it's a heavenly kingdom. And we'll look at that a little bit later and even more next week. But when Pilate asked the question, he was concerned about whether or not Jesus was going to start some kind of revolt, some kind of uprising, some, time, some type of attempt to overthrow this part of the Roman Empire of which Pilate had jurisdiction. And so in Pilate's view, this would take followers, it would take military might, it would take power as he understood it. And so this is why he asked Jesus the question. But Jesus response is interesting. As Karen Jobes points out, she says, Jesus understood himself to be not the king of the Jews, but the eternal king of the far greater kingdom of God. Jesus does not deny his kingship, but denies it to have an earthly geopolitical character, much less an immediate threat to Roman rule. What Jobes is pointing out is what Jesus clearly is saying. This kingdom that, that Jesus is king of is not only not of this world, it's not a political kingdom. The, the character of Jesus' kingdom is markedly different than what Pilate, or even what Jesus' closest disciples thought. I, I want to remind you that in one gospel, James and John asked the question, but in Matthew, it's James and John's mother who asked the question, that when Jesus comes into his kingdom, um, can, can one of my sons sit at your right hand? and the other at your left. 
They didn't understand what Jesus meant by kingdom. They really thought it was going to be some political kingdom, some theocracy that would that would happen where Jesus would, would overthrow uh, Rome and inaugurate, at least for uh, Jerusalem and Israel, a, a nation of its own. J.C. Ryle wrote, Our Lord's main object in saying, My kingdom is not of this world, was to inform Pilate's mind concerning the true nature of his kingdom and to correct any false impression he might have received from the Jews. He tells him that he did not come to set up a, a kingdom which would interfere with the Roman government. He did not aim at establishing a temporal power to be supported by armies and maintained by taxes. The only dominion he exercised was over men's hearts, and the only weapons that his subjects employed were spiritual weapons, a kingdom which required neither money nor servants for its support was one which the Roman emperors need not be afraid. In the highest sense, it was a kingdom not of this world. J.C. Ryle is correct. Jesus is saying, my, my kingdom is not what you think it is. It's not even from here. It's not from this world. Now, Pilate may have just thought Jesus was crazy at this point. In fact, he probably did. But we'll find out later. That Pilate's wife had a dream and it made Pilate afraid. At any rate, that's, a, that's next week. What we know is that Jesus was not coming to set up some kind of political kingdom, some kind of governmental kingdom. That is not what this was about, and that's not what it's ever been about. In fact, the, our own doctrinal standards, the Westminster Confession of Faith, let us know that, that the New Testament... Uh, did something. When it comes to the ceremonial law, we know that, that in Christ, all of the ceremonial laws were abrogated. That's the language of the Westminster Confession. But also, the judicial laws, the laws of the land that pertained, as it says in the, the Confession, to the state of that people, that is the nation of Israel, that, that they're, not, they're not obligations any longer. That we can, we can use the general equity of those laws, the general principles that might govern a nation. But that, in other words, what, what the Westminster Confession is saying is, what Jesus is saying, Jesus' kingdom is not a political kingdom. There is no longer a theocracy. There is no longer a chosen nation politically. Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. And it's different. But how? So let's talk a little bit about what the kingdom is. And, and to understand the kingdom that Jesus brings, we have to look into his teachings on the kingdom. And I'll just let you know that there is absolutely no way in one sermon at any point we can be exhaustive about our discussion about the kingdom. But what we do know is this. At the beginning of John the Baptist's ministry, he says something interesting, the same thing that Jesus says at the beginning of his ministry. They both say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he's, he's letting us know that there's something that he is bringing, that he is partially bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. But later on in his teaching, we learn, and later on in the Bible, we learn that that the fullness of his kingdom will be consummated when he returns again. In fact, when he talks about the kingdom of God, he does send his disciples out to proclaim the kingdom of God. And it's even called sometimes the good news of the kingdom of heaven or the good news of the kingdom. So what exactly is Jesus teaching that this kingdom is? I mean, those are some overview ideas, but what does he teach? Well, one significant thing that we can say is that Jesus teaches that his kingdom is an inside-out kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is an inside-out kingdom. It begins in the heart, and then it moves through our lives. And in fact, it always has. That's been God's way since the beginning, even with Adam and Eve. In the garden, what did, they, what did God expect of Adam and Eve? 
He expected that they would trust him, that they would believe him from their hearts, from all, because all of who they are was just so interconnected. No sin in the picture to fragment the different parts of who they are. And they were to trust God and obey him. But they disobeyed. When they were tempted, they sinned and they brought sin, the condition of sin, into our lives. It's for all of us. We're all born sinners of, and enemies of God. Enemies of his kingdom, of his rule and reign over us. And so that's why Jesus taught at the beginning of John, in John 3, when he was talking with Nicodemus, that the only way to enter the kingdom of God is to be born again. Nicodemus was confused. He thought that he would have to be physically born again, and Jesus said, no. No, you need to be born of the Spirit. But he was clear, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, how, how can you be born again then? It's by faith in Jesus Christ, but this requires humility. That's why Jesus, at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit are those who see the desperate state of their hearts. As John Stott writes, to be poor in spirit is to acknowledge our spiritual poverty. Indeed, our spiritual bankruptcy before God. For we are sinners under the holy wrath of God and deserving nothing but the judgment of God. We have nothing to offer, nothing to plead, nothing with which to buy the favor of heaven. You see, when we understand our desperation, then we throw ourselves in desperate humility upon the mercy of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Later on in his earthly ministry, Jesus said that, that in order to, to enter the kingdom, we have to have faith like a child. In Matthew 18, the disciples asked him, who is the greatest in the kingdom? And Jesus called a child and put him in the midst of them. And we have to understand in that day, children didn't have the esteem that we have now. It's, it's not that they weren't loved or cared for, but we, we sort of um, put our kids on pedestals. That's certainly not what the case was then. Children were part of the family. They were expected to do their, their tasks, their chores. But Jesus says, truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Children knew that they didn't have the standing in their families yet. There was a certain humility about them. And Jesus takes an unlikely situation and tells the disciples, your faith needs to be like that of a child. You need to know that the greatest in the kingdom is humble like a child. Their faith is like a child. Dependence, utter dependence upon their parents. Jesus talks more about the quality of the faith for those in the kingdom when he says that it's nearly impossible for the wealthy to enter the kingdom of heaven. That's a difficult teaching because Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record Jesus saying this. And if we're honest, we know that we are actually among the wealthy in the world. Jesus says in each of these accounts, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. He's using a word picture. We know it is crazy to think that a huge camel could go through the eye of a needle. And he said it's easier for that to happen. Why? Why is it nearly impossible for the wealthy to enter heaven? Because we cling to our own little kingdoms that are built upon our wealth. We cling to things other than God for life, for happiness, for fulfillment. Sometimes we even do this weird thing of, of thinking that worldly success equals heavenly gain. But Jesus teaches that we have to give up everything for the sake of the kingdom. 
which is similar to what he taught in, in other parables. In Matthew 13, there's a collection of parables, and in several of them, it says that something to the effect of Jesus' kingdom is of inestimable value so that we give up everything to have it, that it's such a prized possession to have. We give up everything to have it. And the kingdom is, is to be such that we seek the kingdom of God before we seek anything else. And Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, in chapter 6 of Matthew, teaches about our worries about tomorrow, about what we'll eat or drink or what we'll wear. And today, in our age, we have refrigerators, we have freezers, we have pantries, we have closets full of clothes. And we can miss the point. Jesus was speaking to a people who would work that day for the day's bread. Who likely didn't have a change of clothing. If they did, they had one other outfit. And so Jesus is telling them, don't worry about tomorrow because God cares for the lilies of the field, the birds in the sky. Will he not care for you? Don't worry about tomorrow because it'll have its own troubles. But instead of worrying, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, these things, these necessities, they'll be added to you as well. What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is this heavenly kingdom that Jesus is ushering in that rules over the whole of our lives, so much so that we don't even worry about what we're going to eat or how we're going to be clothed tomorrow because we trust that God's going to provide. You see, the kingdom of God is the humble receipt of his rule and reign over every part of our lives. No part of our lives is excluded. Our heart, soul, strength, and mind, all of it's included. An entrance into the kingdom requires one to be born again. But it also requires something else. It requires a superior righteousness. You see, in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 5, Jesus tells us, that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. If we are born in sin, if we're born as enemies of God, and if, as the Old Testament teaches us, the righteousness that we produce on our own, apart from God, is as filthy rags, and that none are righteous in his sight, then how... Can we enter the kingdom of heaven with a righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees? I mean, they had an outward righteousness that appeared exemplary. Even though Jesus pointed out their hearts were wretched, just like our hearts. This brings us to the third point, why we need this kingdom. The kingdom of God is all about Jesus. We brought the dominion of sin and Satan into God's kingdom. But Jesus, the victorious king, conquered sin and Satan through his life, death, and resurrection. And he did this to usher in the kingdom of heaven for those who are born again by the Spirit of God. He was the righteous one who died once for all for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, it says in 1 Peter 3.18. We need this kingdom because we need Jesus. Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. It is not just about some corrupt power. There's no abuse to Jesus' power. He is bringing the kingdom of heavenly power and authority. But we have to ask, wh whose kingdom am I living in? If you've never submitted to God, if you've never seen yourself as poor in spirit without any hope except in his sovereign mercy, I pray that you might see that even listening to these few words from this passage. 
But if you have submitted yourself to God, you know that life is a struggle as a Christian. That there are parts of your life that you struggle with submitting to Him. It might be your time. You struggle to submit your time. I'm just so busy, busy, busy. But your time is His time. Although we think my time is mine. What about your wallet? Well, my money is mine. Is it? What about your bodies? Well, my body's mine. I have natural urges. I need to whatever. Is that what Jesus says? And what are you doing about it? If you know there are areas in your life that you're struggling to submit, are you, you trying to do better? Are you doing more? Are you doing less? How's that working for you? I'm guessing it's not working real well. Because when we try to make changes on our own power, that's just another way of living under our own authority, our own power, our own kingdom. Doing it ourselves, our way. But what if we started differently? What if we began to see that Jesus, our King, took on our greatest enemy, sin and death, and he conquered it? And he conquered Satan, who was also a great enemy. And he did this for us. And he gave us his spirit to indwell us to remind us of the good news of the gospel, that Jesus never intended for us to do all of this on our own, but instead by the power of the Spirit, by the ministry of the Word of God, and by the community of believers around us, we can actually move forward and walk in newness of life and pursue more and more each day the righteousness that Jesus desires for us. What if we can see that Jesus' kingdom is not just about now, but it is an eternal kingdom? What if we could be reminded of what we read in Revelation 12, when the loud voice from heaven says, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. What if it would be said of Jesus, he is the victorious king, he has thrown down our accuser. It will be said of him, it is true of him. And that we have conquered our accuser, not by our own power, but by the blood of the Lamb. And by the word of our testimony. And what is our testimony? That we are poor in spirit. We have nothing to offer God, but he made us alive in Jesus. So that we are born again into the kingdom of God. By faith in Jesus Christ. What if that was our starting point as we looked at those areas in our life that we're having a hard time letting go of? And we see the lengths to which God has gone to bring us into his kingdom. I think we'll begin to see our lives differently. I pray that we would. Father, I ask that this week you would by your Spirit, allow us to see areas in our life that we are holding in, in control. They're in our own kingdom, and that you would, by your Spirit and your Word, by the community of believers around us, cause us to loosen our hold onto the things we try to control. And by your power, we would embrace your kingship over us. Your kingdom that is not of this world. Instead, it is holy, righteous, and good.
Help us to see it as such. In Jesus' name, amen. I pray that the Lord will bless you this week.